On your behalf, I want to thank all those who participated in worship this morning, the instrumentalist, um, the praise team, singers, um, the lay leaders in worship, as well as ushers and uh, those serving in the church nursery today. We thank God for them, each one. It's my privilege to bring God's Word to you this morning. I'm going to do so from Psalm 63 in your Bible. Psalm 63, under the theme this morning, Finding God in the Desert. Finding God in the Desert. Let me preface my reading of Psalm 63 with the statement that um, my wife and I Quite some years ago now, I had the privilege of going to Israel or Palestine with Ray Vanderlaan. Many of you have heard of him. Wonderful educational, inspirational time there. Some years later, we went to Asia Minor, the site of the early churches. Much of what was taught, of course, has been forgotten. But some things remember, re, uh, continue. And one statement that Brother Ray mentioned, that the... There were three lands in the Old Testament, said he. The land of Egypt was Pharaoh's land. The land of Canaan was the people's land. And the desert, said he, the desert, that was God's land. Or God's classroom, may I say. Where he would bring his people to teach them many lessons. To make himself known so that they would know who their God was. And in the desert, that they might know how deeply he loved them and cared for them. How, how completely they could trust him. Spiritual truths taught in the desert. God did that for his people Israel. He did that for his king David. And he's been doing that for his children as well. For you and me in our day. The bulk of the psalms, may I say, are desert psalms, desert psalms, most of them written by David while in the desert. Psalm 63 is one of those. Let me read it, and then we're going to learn from David what to do when we are led into the desert. Psalm 63, hear the word of God. O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you, in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory, because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands." My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. They who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword. And become food for jekylls. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God's name will praise him. While the mouth of liars will be silenced. Heavenly Father, the words of Psalm 63. We have read them often. But I pray that we may hear afresh your word to us from Psalm 63 in this morning. That if and when we find ourselves in the desert, that we can find God there. And find it to be a painful experience, yes, indeed. But also a fruitful experience. To that end, anoint me with your Holy Spirit and help us to hear your voice today. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Dear people of God, friends in Christ, there's a book that has so blessed me. I may have referenced it before, but it's written by one named David Jeremiah. It's entitled, A Bend in the Road, A Bend in the Road. David Jeremiah, you no doubt have heard of him, a very uh, well-known pastor 
in uh, California, a large church there. He's on the radio. Turning Points is his radio broadcast. A prolific writer is he. And he's still doing very, very well, Elder Day now. But some 30 years ago, he had a bend in the road, a bend in the road, as he says, and that led to that book. He had a physical done, routine, discovered there was an issue, a problem. A tumor had developed. He went to Mayo Clinic, had surgery. Ten years later, it resurfaced, back to Cl Mayo Clinic, rather, and other surgery. By the grace of God, he's doing well. But out of that experience, he wrote that book, Coming to a Bend in the Road, which appears to be the end of the road. The subtitle for the book is Experiencing God When Your World Caves In. Experiencing God When Your World Caves In. And that can happen, can it not? That our world seemingly can cave in. I suspect it's happened to some of you listening to my voice today. There was a time when your world caved in. In that book, David Jeremiah speaks of a person named Steve Garrison. He had a very successful commercial real estate business in California. But then a slowdown came and a recession. And suddenly those buildings, which were filled with tenants, a very excellent income coming from that. Suddenly, there were no tenants and no buyers. And in spite of all of his strong efforts, Steve Garrison's development company faded and folded. And Steve has these words in that book. He says, I came to a major bend in the road. And around the bend, I found myself in a spiritual desert. In that desert, I began to see some things in regard to my spiritual walk with God, how it had eroded during the years of success and fruitfulness in business. Some things as my reputation, the esteem of my colleagues, my net worth, my many assets, he become near idols in my life. I didn't even realize, says Steve, that I had lifted these things to such a level of importance. And then in the desert, when his world caved in, Steve says that he came to love God once again. As he had never loved him before. He learned to look at life from the perspective of eternity. He came to appreciate anew those treasures that were his that could not and would not ever be taken from him. Enduring treasures, eternal treasures. So it was for David, as he wrote Psalm 63. Early on in his life, he had been called to be a leader amongst God's people. Not by his own choosing, but by God's will. And now David was king, and in his Kingship, there were early tests and trials, but, but now things had gone well. He was at the height of his popularity. The nation was prospering. But then comes a setback. Ever so suddenly, ever so unexpectedly, family problems arise. Maybe you know the story. There's a strained relationship with his son, one called Absalom, one who is going throughout the country to create a situation where people will become discontented with their leader. And Absalom has that secret effort or motivation to turn the people from David to himself. He wants to secure the throne from his father. And so he gathers this group of malcontents, may I say, and, and has this conspiracy behind the scenes thing happening. And David finds out about that. You can read the story, 2 Samuel 15, the betrayal 
by his own son. And not only that, but also the betrayal by one of his most trusted counselors. Ahithophel is his name. And David, shockingly, then must flee the throne, flee Jerusalem. And he goes into the desert of Judah. And if you read Psalm 63, you read underneath that psalm. Written in the desert of Judah. He goes there to find safety, to hide. David is sad. He's alone when he's in hiding. He cannot believe what has just happened. How suddenly his world has caved in. What does David do? What can we learn from him from this psalm? I think you have an outline in your bulletin this morning. I may direct you there. But note with me first, David's deep desire for God in the desert his seeking or his craving heart. I read verse 1 again. Oh God, David says, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. The landscape of the desert pretty much pictures David's present predicament. It's hot. It's dry. It's miserable. His heart is filled with pain, with anguish. He finds himself in deep, deep distress. And in that moment, David cries out to God. God is all seemingly that he has. He is the only one David can trust. The only one. Maybe for some of us here, we can identify with that. Our world was shattered too. And we turn to God and says, God, you are there for me. Can I trust you? Can I trust you? Because things have happened that are so cruel, so senseless, so undeserving, so wrong. Maybe you were blindsided as David was by a certain happening, a certain tragedy. And out in the desert, in the desert, you cry out. You cry out to God. And I want to suggest that is a good thing. That is a wise thing to do. Because God hears the cries of his children in the desert. To those who earnestly seek him, God is kind. Psalm 62, it says, My soul finds rest in God alone, David the writer. My salvation comes from him. He alone, note the word, alone is my rock, my salvation, my fortress. I will not be shaken. A bit later, find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock, my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him. For God, God is our refuge. I see again. When in the desert, it's very wise and necessary to do what David did. To cry out to God. To cry out to God. To earnestly seek him. There's something else, though, that is right to do. Again, it's something David did. I want to continue reading verses 2 through 5. David says in the desert, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live in your name. 
I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. My singing lips, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Praising lips. Reminds me of Psalm 138, another desert psalm. Another one written by David. One in which he worships God right in the midst of trouble. Now that may seem somewhat odd or strange or even quite impossible to do. Praising God in the desert. Seemingly what strange counsel that is. How can you possibly do that? It may not be easy, and it is not. But I don't suggest it is a wise thing to do. Good and helpful when you face a bend in the road, when your world caves in, to go take out a hymn book. Yes, a hymn book. And offer praise to God in a time of great adversity. David Jeremiah says in his book, these are his words, genuine praise offered stubbornly in the face of adversity makes no sense by any worldly calculation. That's fine, says he. There are some things done that will never make sense. When we sing God's praises, as David does in Psalm 63, not in response to prosperity or some very good happening, but in the face of adversity, we unleash a victorious power in the world of pain. David Jeremiah says, we create then an environment where miracles happen. Creating an environment where miracles happen. Because God delights in the praises of his people. And especially, especially in those praises that arise from his people who find themselves in the desert. You noted, David praises God with his lips. That's in verse 3. He does so with his hands. That's in verse 4. He does so with his mouth. That's in verse 5. He praises God because he knows God loves him still and always. In fact, he says his love is better than life itself. Better than life itself. Is that your testimony and mine? When I read Psalm 63... See someone praising God in the face of adversity. My mind sees Ethel, Ethel. A dear saint, the first church I served many years ago now. But Ethel was in a nursing home. And not a very nice nursing home. Such a foul odor every time I went there. And Ethel had had a leg amputated. She was always in a wheelchair. Her husband had died. She had a son, but I noted that he rarely came to visit her. You would expect that she would be somewhat despondent. Every time I walked to the door, there was that smiling face, that cheerful soul. And we would converse for a bit, and then I would say, Ethel, it is time now for me to go. Can I read a scripture today? What is your favorite scripture? And I can still hear her saying, Pastor, Pastor, it's that one in the Psalms, that one in the Psalms, the one that says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the sons of men. Read that again, Ethel. Smiling face, singing heart, in the face of so much adversity. When I read Psalm 63, I think of a person at Friendship Church some years ago now, relatively young, young daughter at home, 
out of the blue, she's dealing with a tumor. She goes to the hospital to report prognosis was not that good, but it was removed. A year later, it resurfaced, and, and they removed it again, and she's doing well today. She's a school teacher. But I still remember being in the hospital room with her and saying, can you share with me, what is your scripture, your favorite? And she said, Pastor, it's Psalm 13, Psalm 13, that last verse. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been so good to me. On a hospital bed. Her testimony, her favorite verse. One other person comes to mind. Sue Eisenhoff is in church with us this morning, and it's her father. Reverend Lee Coning, one of my closest friends in ministry, but Lee has been gone for seven, eight years now. He died of cancer. Toward the end, when I saw him, he was so frail and so weak, so weak. But one of his favorite songs, I think they used it at his funeral, the one that you love here at Faith Community, 10,000 reasons, 10,000 reasons. That final verse, Lee's testimony, on that day, when my strength is failing, the end draws near, my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending 10,000 years and then forevermore. That's what he did then on his deathbed. That's what he's doing now. Because your love is better than life itself. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live in your name. I will lift up my hands, even in the desert. A seeking heart. Praising lips. David has some further instruction. Verses 6 through 8. On my bed, says he, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me or holds me fast. David meditated. He remembered God. His past mercies to him. His great faithfulness to him. That is a good thing. That is a good discipline for our thinking, especially, especially when we find ourselves in the desert, to lift our thoughts to God, to lift them heavenward, to remember, to remember. Lewis Meads has written a wonderful book about hope that includes these words. He says, a person who has the habit of hope also has the habit of remembering, remembering. Hope needs memory, says Lewis, the way a writer needs notes. If we expect to keep hope alive, we need to keep memories alive. Happy memories of good times we had hope for, have hope for that were fulfilled and grateful memories of bad times that we somehow survived. When we find ourselves in a desert, it helped to remember God in times gone by or in ages past. We remember in the present that, that nothing happens that's outside of his will. Nothing has happened. It may be a surprise to us, but it was not to him. And our memories in this new experience help us to trust God's faithfulness. In a new and difficult situation, David says, verse 6, I think of you through the watches of the night, perhaps when he could not sleep. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings for you. Your right hand holds me. 
Remembering God is such a wise and good thing to do. As I said, his past mercies to you, his earlier faithfulness to you in life, to remember God in the desert. A seeking heart, praising lips, a remembering mind. One thing further. In the desert to have a confident belief or faith. A confident belief or faith. Listen to David's faith, his faith assertion. Verse 9. They who seek my life, they will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become the food of jekylls. But the king, the king, I will rejoice in God. All who swear by God's name will praise him while the mouths of liars will be silenced. I think David had something of what we would call maybe a premonition, a premonition. How it was going to happen, he didn't know. And when it was going to happen, he didn't know that either. But David was sure of something, that things were going to work out okay. That this wasn't going to lead to sorrow, but ultimately to joy. Good would win out over evil. Absalom, his son with all of his evil plots and plans... David was confident that they weren't going to be successful in the end. And so it happens. And so it happens. You can read the story. 2 Samuel 18. But maybe you remember the story. Absalom is riding along on his mule at a fast pace. He's got long hair and he goes through a tree with a hanging branch and his, catches his hair. And the mule goes on. And there hangs Absalom. The text of Scripture says he hangs between heaven and earth. David's general comes along, sees that. He makes an end to Absalom's life with a sword. David hears and he grieves. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son. You know the story. You know the story. But the crisis is now over. And David can return to Jerusalem once again, to his rightful throne. And that is what he does. But David says, in advance of all of this happening, he says, those who are seeking my life will be destroyed, will be given over to the sword. God will take care of that. Psalm 73. The struggle that the psalm writer had of seeing the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer, all so confusing and so disturbing. But then, as he says, he goes into the sanctuary of God and he finds their peace. He finds a peace that the wicked cannot share in. He concludes, those who are far from you, they will perish. In the end, you will destroy all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. And that is where he was. It's good for me to be near God. Indeed, dear friends, it is. Always, but especially in the desert. To be near God. Or to know that God is close to you. I pray that if or when you find yourself in the desert, that yes, you may feel the warm embrace of your God as never before. You may discover anew just how much he cares for you and that he loves you to realize how fully you can trust the God of your salvation. As we're going to sing in just a moment, those who trust him wholly will find him wholly true and trustworthy. Amen?
Join me in prayer. Oh God, we are so grateful that you are a God for all seasons of life, for all situations that may arise in life. Thank you for Psalm 63 in the Bible, and for the spiritual truth that when our world may cave in, you are there and you will be there for us. Oh God, help us with David of old to earnestly seek you in the desert. Always, of course, but especially when we find ourselves in the desert. And may we discover as he did what an awesome and good God you are to those who put their trust in you. Amen.